So if I could just uh, introduce Giovanni, and um, thank you. Giovanni, over the last 10 years, has consistently been awarded uh, two chef's hats in the uh, Sydney Morning Herald uh, Food Guide, yeah, which is quite an achievement. So really, he knows what he's talking about, okay? Um, Giovanni grew up in Sardinia. Anyone know where Sardinia is? That was one of my questions. <laughs> we, probably, we probably should put the map up so everybody can see where it is, yeah? FD, where is it from? Sorry, where is it exactly? Can you describe it? It's in the Mediterranean Sea. V very good, yeah? Somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> so do you, what, what we sort of, um, and what Giovanni's background has been, is been trying to um, introduce into his cuisine a lot of things which would have been, he would have grown up with, yeah? What they would have typically eaten in Sardinia. All right, so that's really a feature about his uh, restaurant. Um, so I've just got some questions today about, was there anything else in my introduction I missed? No, all good. All good. All good. Uh, Giovanni came to Australia in uh, 1992, is that correct? Yes. After meeting his wife, yeah, his wife was on a holiday. No one was born here. I was. Okay. All right. uh, he met his wife there and he decided to come to Australia. Uh, when you came to Australia, what did you decide to do then? Can you hear me, guys? Uh, morning, everyone, and thanks for having me. Very exciting that um, I get to share my stories amongst um, you know people that are passionate about our industry because it's a brilliant industry, and I, uh, I love it. Loved it from minute one, and still love it after 25 years. Um, so I came in '92, and then um, to be honest, I didn't start working as a chef straight away because I did French at school, so I had no English whatsoever my English was zero. So to get a job in a kitchen was very challenging because the language barrier was quite, you know, it was too much. So I ended up working with my father-in-law, who well, back then wasn't, it was my girlfriend's father, my wife now. And uh, he gave me a job and he, uh, he's a concreter by uh, trade. So after six months, I had muscles double of what I've got now because I was lifting lots of heavy stuff and that. And um, I did that, and that, that was good. That was my first introduction to Australia. But I, I really loved you know, Australia for minute one, so I really wanted to um, you know, probably live here and stay here. Um, and it wasn't only you know, for the love that I had for Maryland, which is my wife and the mother of my kids, but also it's because Australia, I felt that you know, there was something that attracted me. There were possibilities here, you know, the place was nice, and. Then I got a job, you know, in a restaurant, and that, and that, and that was, you know, where my life really started. Yeah, but we did a little bit of backs and forwards. Went back to Sardinia, came back, and then I decided to stay, and then got, you know, my first job in an Italian restaurant. So, in this kitchen, uh, there was only the owner that spoke Italian, and another uh, person, which was the head chef, Mimo, and everyone else spoke English. So it was quite hard for me to start with. Um, but yeah, that was my first impact. So uh, where did your passion for Italian cuisine come from? <laughs> so it all started when, um, how long have we got? We've got four or five hours? No, um, it, all, it all started when, um, look, I went to school until I was about uh, 17. To, uh, I was starting to be a draftsman. And to be honest, I got to a point when I got to the fourth year, I was nearly done. I had one year to go and I literally switched off completely and I said to my parents you know what I really appreciate that you are you know giving me the opportunity to study and become a draftsman maybe go to university like my brother and my sister did they did really well my sister is got four degrees in medicine my brother was a solicitor so I was the only one that I could not go back to school anymore because during summer because you know the summer break in Italy is three months so it's quite long so I always you know went to get a job with my uncle and my auntie which they had no kids they had a bar slash restaurant, and I used to do three months with them, and I was brought up like their son, you know? So they gave me a job. Um, I never got paid to start with. Uh, my first pay after three months was a new push bike, which for me was incredible. Um, and that started my passion in, you know, what I, be, you know, what I, what I am now in our, you know, in our great industry. Um, and to start with was quite tough. 
uh, because uh, my job was I was I started when I was 15, so I was quite short. That hasn't changed much. I'm pretty short, but I was quite short. And back then there was no glass washers, so in the bar you washed the glasses. You had two sinks. One was clean water. One was soapy water, so you had to soap the glasses and then rinse them. And I did that for three months on a crate. Okay? Seven days, because it was summer, and in, in, in um, Sardinia, like a lot of places, you know, like islands and um, holiday resorts, you know that you got to make the most of it when the summer season is, is there. So three months, seven days a week. But you know what? I was so, I, I loved it so much that, you know, then I got to a point of, that I wanted to quit studying what I was doing and then, you know, start in the hospitality industry. So that's what, that, that, was, that was the time that I kicked on, I think. My passion started from there. We should have two of these, it'd be easier. Yeah. <laughs> um, and what about your first job in hospitality when you arrived in Australia? What were you doing then? So, <coughs> yeah, I got a job at this Italian restaurant, like I told you before, and it, it was good because like the, the toughest thing was, you know, that I couldn't communicate with anyone much. So, uh, you know, it was quite hard. And um, so when I got, you know, when I went for a little interview with Peter, which now is one of my, you know, great friends, he said, look, I'm sp I speak Italian and the chef speaks Italian and everyone else speaks English here. You're going to have to start on the cold lara section and pastry. And the chef was a Canadian um, chef. So it was interesting for me so he said look I'll give you a job but you know maybe it's not going to work and then I was there for four years he gave me a job and I stayed for four years and then uh, he didn't want me to leave when I left so uh, you know it, it was it was you know um, a good start for me and it, it, Peter helped me a lot as well in terms of not only giving me a job but also in terms of you know like starting my life um, in Australia so he became one of my best friends Right. Um, so in 2004, you decided to open your own restaurant, yeah? Was this your first venture into an entrepreneurial ship? And is there any history in your family of people running their own businesses? In um, 2004, we opened up Pillow Freshwater. But before then, we opened up a small restaurant, um, which it was only tiny. It had 11 tables inside, and it was called Cala Luna. And we ran that for seven years. So basically, from when I was at Piemonte, I was there for four years. Then I moved to a restaurant in North Sydney for three years. And then I met this guy, an English guy, um, Tony Nelson, that we used to work together. And it all started from, we used to go for a coffee break in North Sydney. Back then, there wasn't many coffee shops. There was like a handful of them. And there was one that I can remember that they used to serve. I don't know if anyone here remembers them. I don't see them a, a lot anymore. but. There used to be, it was a caramel little uh, cookie, tart, that he had, top and bottom was biscotti, and then in the middle had this caramel, um, you know, fudge kind of rich um, mix. And they went in all these coffee shops. And then w we went one afternoon, and, you know, the usual two coffees, two caramel fudge tarts, and the guy said, oh, actually, that we can't get those anymore. Um, he said, the, the company that makes them, they stopped making them because, you know, they, they just stopped making these things. And I said to Tony, I said, Tony, why don't we start making these bloody things and sell it to all the coffee shops? We're going to make so much money because everyone loves them. So we started going around and getting all business cards from all the cafes and restaurants and venues because we wanted to start making these things and then sell them. And in the meantime, Tony was doing part-time at what, you know, back then was Vouts, and then it became Cala Luna. And then in the meantime, we're getting organized to open up a little biscotti factory and, and go in partnership with him, and, you know. Um, and Tony said, oh, you know, Giovanni, the place that I do some casual work at, at the Spit, um, the lady, she's got a problem with her knees, and she wants to sell the place. And I said, restaurant? And, I, and he said, yeah, yeah, why, 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 don't we, why don't we take it on, you and I? And I said... Tony, I'm 27, I got zero money, and I can't, like, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm ready for it. He was five years older than me, so I was a lot more experienced than, you know, and he said, look, it, she doesn't want a lot of money, let's give her a crack. You know, it's a small place, we can run it, it'll be just the two of us, we will need many staff, and so anyway, long story short, we took her over, and that was our first you know, restaurant and venture. And I ran that restaurant together with Tony for five years. And it was 
an incredible experience, like amazing. You know, running your own restaurant, you're young, 27, then we had the first baby, bought our first unit in fresh water, that's up to here, absolutely no money. Um, we used to work seven days and nights, and every night we used to have to mop the floor ourselves. On Sunday, we didn't have a kitchen end, because we couldn't afford it, so we had to cook and wash dishes. So it was full on, but loved it, every minute of it. I just might uh, just go back there a step. You're talking about working in North Sydney. Whereabouts was that? Um, the place was called Grand Cafe Tuscany, which was on Berry Street. And to be honest, it doesn't exist anymore because they put a high rise there and um, there was the restaurant down the stairs. Um, and next door, there was a coffee shop. There was a little tiny lane called Spring Street. And there was a place called Primavera Cafe. Some people may remember. There was a guy from Naples running it. And that was probably one of the first coffee shops in North Sydney. So I worked there because Mimo, the guy that it was at my first restaurant, opened up that and then I followed him for, you know, about three and a half years. I just had to ask that question because we and Blue actually started in North Sydney, yeah? So we were actually just around the corner then, yeah, before we went, moved into North Point. Uh, uh, the old restaurant, yeah, great. Um, just going back a, a step, though, before the restaurant, you were talking about your first job working here as well. You were working in the ladder section. So what sort of, what's, what were some of your responsibilities and tasks back then? So my responsibilities as a ladder chef were quite, look, it, it, the restaurant was quite traditional Italian cuisine, so it's not like what we do now, a pillow of fresh water, that the guys on ladder actually have to cook at least two or three dishes, so it's a lot more involved. Um, but back then was literally, you know, the potato dishes, the salads, the side dishes. And I was lucky enough to work with Shelley, with this Canadian pastry chef, that I, that I learned to, um, a little bit of pastry, because I think, you know, a chef should know about pastry. Although pastry chefs are, I call them a different breed. You know, they're just a different world. There's so much more chemistry. And, but I'm, I was lucky enough to learn, you know, the basics of uh, pastry, which, you know, I was uh, able to make simple, you know, things like a proper sponge cake and, you know, crank caramel and all those things. Um, yeah, zabaglione and then, you know, tiramisu, I'm a master of it now. But zabaglione was actually interesting because zabaglione was made at the table and, they, and Peter used to do it old-fashioned, which I love and I wish it came back. He used to have a big copper bowl and take the eggs to the table with the marsala and all that, and then whip these egg yolks and make it into a zabaglione and serve it. And when the eggs were like not too young and maybe you know there was a problem with the something and it wouldn't work, it was an absolute nightmare because he used to come back into the kitchen, throw stuff, and the bowl wasn't polished properly, and he blamed it on everyone else, and then he had to go back and do it again. But it was you know an incredible thing to do at the table. Um, but yeah. So that's, that's, look, it wasn't much to do for me, but it was a busy restaurant. So I learned not only, you know, uh, cooking and the techniques and what, you know, then going to taste, you know, I got better and better at that. Um, but also I think I learned how to, you know, behave in a restaurant and in a kitchen and in a team environment because, you know, Peter was very good at that. There was a great team and I think that's important as well. So uh, Giovanni, you're just mentioning they're going to TAFE. So um, what sort of things did you learn there and what sort of things did you take from TAFE, yeah, that have sort of assisted you in your, uh, in your career? Um, TAFE was probably the second most important part of my life in Australia. Um, the first part was obviously meeting Marilyn and coming here. That is my most important part. But TAFE was, it was quite overwhelming because when I was at Piemonte, then Peter said, Giovanni, if you want to stay in this country, you need to learn two things. You need to learn the techniques better, and you've got to go to college, and then you need to learn the language. And TAFE was you know, the place that I learned both. So when I went to enroll, um, there was a guy by the name of Peter Bansley. He's my dear friend now, and sometimes he works for me now. He's my teacher back then. And he said to Marilyn, this was all translated, because obviously my English was nil. So, he went around, you know, discussion of three and said to Marilyn, don't worry, Giovanni will do okay, I'll take care of him, just get him to come to TAFE, you know, uh, they're they, um, practical, it won't be difficult because, you know, you can 
if someone shows you something, then you got to repeat it. And if someone points at something, you know what, you know, uh, the whiskeys or the Lidl or the wooden spoon or this or that. So that was quite good. But then probably the hardest part for me was the theory part, which was a two-hour um, theory lesson every Monday because I only went once a week. I went part-time to TAFE. And um, that was hard because I used to do the lesson. So you can imagine the teacher is talking and doing stuff on the board for two hours. I'm just looking at him going, what are you talking about? And then he will call Marilyn and then she'll translate it back to me in Italian. And that went around for about two and a half years. So that was quite hard. And then at the end of the course, I actually won an award for communication skills because then I, I loved it so much and my English was improving so quickly that you know, I, I, I did so well, and then I got, I got this award, which was quite amazing. Um, and I think there was two reasons for that. One is because I always wanted to learn a different language, and I, was, I wasn't great at school, but French I loved because it was another language. And then when I started to learn English, which was my dream to learn English, I picked it up quite quickly. And then, um, you know, the other thing then, you know, the taste then, you know, started becoming so much fun, and I, I, met, I met great people and they were still friends with and my teachers like I said Steve and Pete now they my dear friends and sometimes they give me a hand when I need a hand at the restaurant so um, you know I, I made some really good friendships and TAFE was amazing I can't speak highly enough of you know TAFE and, and training and the college that I went to because it's important that you take your time and you do your training before you become a chef and that was really what you know I really loved so uh, you should be able to relate to what Giovanni's talking about there, the, the sort of information that he learned from when he went to school, just like you guys coming here at this stage, yeah? yeah. Um, so what you, we talked about, then you opened up your own restaurant, yeah, after spending those formative years in a few restaurants in North Sydney down at, down at the Spit, is that correct? And uh, what about the first 12 months of running your own restaurant? Was it all uh, a lot of fun and glamour or was it really hard work? And what did you like most about it? And what did you love at least? Um, let's get the bad things out of the way first. There was nothing that I didn't, I didn't like. I didn't dislike anything. I loved every single moment, and I still do all my restaurants. The two openings that I've done, Calaluna, which was tiny, and it was like eight staff at the end, including my wife and I, and then Pillow Freshwater now, which we run three venues, and we have 55 staff. So the ball game changed quite a lot. So the start of opening up a restaurant or a venue, and I've, I can speak from experience, it's always very, very hard. No matter how good you are, and no matter how many times you do it, it's always challenging because there is different ways of doing things and, you know, and, and, and procedures, and the, 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 you know, the restaurants are so different. So Cala Luna, you know, what I can remember was that you know, it was like, so, we did so many hours, like, we, it was endless hours. We, we, we never slept for three and a half months. We didn't take a wage for three and a half months. We lived off Marilyn's pay. She used to work for a, an airline company that now doesn't exist anymore, Ensign Australia, you may remember it. So that was, you know, what we did. So, but it was so exciting that it drove me every day. I couldn't wait to get up and go to the restaurant. And I remember, you know, hosing the front of the restaurant, getting it clean, set up the tables, getting the mise en place done, and then waiting for the customers to come in. It was a brilliant place. A small, very friendly, home, homely restaurant. We, have cust we had customers that they used to come to Cala Luna, and they were like kids so little that they used to fall asleep at the chair. And then we did the wedding of Freshwater. That's how many years it's been since all these customers kept coming back to us because we built up such a great clientele and relationship with them. So then the opening of Pillow Freshwater was mind-blowing because from eight staff, we went to 28 to 30 to start with a Freshwater. So the ball game really changed. My life and my career was taking a bit of a turn it wasn't, you know, uh, um, anymore to be just a chef or a cook. I was becoming a restaurateur because then you start to, you know, you need to do other things in, in such a big place. You need to manage stuff. You need to, you know, deal with front of house in a different way. Um, the, the two 
teams were you know quite different and then you know the trick was then to put them together to make them work as a team like we are now you know now we are an amazing team there is no front of us or back of ours and there is a wall in between we won't allow it we all want team otherwise you can't run restaurants it's impossible you know the old fashion of the chef boss you come in the kitchen you shut up waira you know and curry plates it doesn't exist at that I'm not sure if it was, you know, something big in the past, but for me, for us, that it, you know, it it doesn't work. Believe me, guys, you need to be all together. Remember, the front of the house, it's crucial, because if you can't get on with them, they taking your food, and they are the ones that you know they give you the customer your finished product. So you you need to get on with them and make sure that you know they believe in what you do and 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 you respect them and it's a mutual respect so there is you know it, it's so important that's a make or break thing okay so yeah um you really sort of went into my next question there as well because we really it was about um is just being a chef all it takes is to be a successful restaurant owner so you're just talking about there about uh, teamwork becomes very important as well what else becomes important about running a successful restaurant apart from apart from just being a good chef obviously then producing the food what other aspects do you think are important i'm going to i'm going to ask you a question guys and then maybe one of you can um, or some of you can give me an answer do you think are you are you all starting to be a chef here or or a friend of ours as well how many chefs are in the house, in the, in the room front of house anybody one oh you got a couple great so because there is yeah it's good and that's good so because you are all becoming a chef do you do you think that it's more important um the food or the service in a restaurant service both both yep anyone else wants to throw it in does anyone think that the food is more important? Why why do you go to a restaurant? Do you go to eat food, right? So what do you think? Chefs? Food is more important? Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Very 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 true. But let me let me and this is something that I actually got in trouble the other night because I was doing a dinner at the restaurant and I say this and one of my young chefs, Marcello, he's only just started, he interpreted what I said because I said that the service is more important than the food. And he said, well, he told my head chef, Jason, he didn't tell me. He said, well, chef said that, you know, service is more important and the food is second. What, what is going on here? You know, we're becoming chefs and why can't, it? he can't say that. And then I had to explain to them um, there is a fine line between more important or better. Okay? So don't get confused. I'm not saying that the service, you know, it's better than the food in a restaurant. It's more important because as a chefs, remember, we work with our hands, okay? And we just, we're not machines. We, we make mistakes. You overcook a steak. You undersalt something. The pasta is overcooked. The fish is dry. That will always happen, no matter how good you are. Believe me, it's happened to all the top chefs in the world. Okay, I I, I can guarantee it a hundred percent. I did an event with uh, Massimo Bottura one day. He came to Sydney. He's number one in the world, and he made risotto, and he forgot to put salt in. We told him to put salt in the risotto, so he's number one chef in the world. So things happen. Okay, so just remember that. But if you have great service. You can fix up any dish that you stuffed up. So, service, it's more important. It's not better, it's more important. Because we are in the service industry. You know, you want your customers to come back and to be happy. So, you know what? Sometimes they put up with something that is not cooked to perfection or whatever. Because you have great front of our staff and service that they can fix up the dish and then the customer comes back. How you do it, it's up to you guys to implement your systems. We got policies that we have to you know follow things like you know it should never be a problem to give a customer what they want unless we haven't got it if someone comes to the restaurant and says can i have the pasta with coriander on top i just go you know what i'm sorry i can't because i don't have coriander but if someone says to me can i have the pasta with cream and mushrooms and i've got mushrooms and i've got cream make it 
you make the customer so happy and they will always come back. So that, that is the policy. You want your customers to come back. Okay? You want bums on seats. Okay? Yes, that, that's what pays your bills, guys. You know? You want sales. You want people to, you know, come. That, that, that's how it works, you know? You don't, you don't improve your business by, you know, cost cutting or, you know, um, get, rid, get rid of staff and you run it lean or using crap produce, you know, saving up from one supplier to the other, a couple of cents here and there. No, that won't fix it because you're compromising that. Sales is what makes, you know, your place keep going. So you need to do that, yeah. So you're just mentioning there about not compromising on quality. So could you give us some examples of maybe of ingredients that you might, you know, consider to be good quality and things that you wouldn't compromise on as well? Um, I think, you know, Australia, I think we're very lucky that, and, I, and, I, and you know, uh, any, anywhere in the world, I think there's good, good produce now and good quality produce. You know, Italy is amazing and, you know, Europe, you can get good produce. Some places are less lucky, like, you know, I went to um, Denmark and I was lucky enough to go to uh, Norma and I was lucky enough to meet Rene and spoke to him about his cuisine and produce that eight months of the year, if they basically have no produce. That's why their cuisine is so crazy and intense and they pickle and they preserve stuff because they get to a point that they can't even have, they only have potatoes and carrots and stuff like that. So not everywhere they're lucky like Australia and maybe Italy and maybe some of the more Mediterranean areas are, they, they have great produce. But I think in Australia there is nothing that you know, we, we have to be you know, jealous about from anywhere in the world. So bad produce, there isn't any. Um, but the only thing that I'm against is imported fresh fruit and veggies. I think that is an absolute crime because there is no need to buy anything that is imported because Australia's got absolutely everything. The only thing that you need to do, you guys, is work with your seasonality, okay? So you must, and some things you may have to bring them in. So if you do, if you, if, because you know, in, in, in Australia we are so lucky, there's so many different cuisines that we can, you know, we can eat from. Like I, I learned to eat um, Thai and Chinese and Vietnamese and Indian when I came to Australia. Coming from a small island with only 1.8 million people, believe me, there is no other cuisines. It's pasta, meat, cheese, and pasta, meat, cheese, and vegetables when, they, when they're in season. And seafood, the seafood in Sardinia came only later because, you know, that's another, you know, long discussion. But a lot of people think that the food of Sardinia is more seafood based because it's an island. But the coast was always dangerous because the invaders used to come. So the Sardinians used to escape and hide in the middle of the island on the hills. So the diet became more meat based and cheese based and, and um, vegetable especially because they, they you know vegetables are easy to grow and cheaper as well um, the seafood came only maybe 80 90 years ago into Sardinia strong um, so produce do you know that how many people live in Australia guys 23 million 22 million yeah 20 million. did you know that Australia produces enough fruit and veggies for 180 million people did you know this? So is there any reason why anyone should buy anything that comes from overseas imported? So when you go into a fruit shop and you see any fruit and veggies that they come from anywhere but Australia, you should never buy them. And I don't care what they say, I don't care what they told me. I had these discussions with you know, the CEO of Harris Farm, Tristan Harris, he's the, he's the, he's the owner after his father. And I told him, I said to him, mate, you are in the best position. It's a family-owned business. You are in the best position of avoiding from bringing anything from overseas. But what I see when I first walk into your shop, in mainly grapes from California and asparagus from South America or whatever, and, it, and Mexico. And he said, you know, that there is reasons why they do these things. He doesn't like it either, but, you know, it, it, it may change eventually, but... It's, it's a tough one. It's a tough call because there is a lot into it. You know, there's government deals and all the rest of it. But you guys are chefs. That is what is going to give you, you know, um, quality of your menus and your um, dishes. It's if you work with 
you know, local ingredients, seasonal ingredients, and then no matter which cuisine you're going to cook, you're going to, you know, you're going to um, win all the time. So, yeah. Um, challenging in, in, you know, ingredients that I don't like, there is nothing that I don't like. Like I said, now I'm lucky enough that I can eat any cuisine and I love anything to do with food. I draw a, a line when they want to give me green raw capsicums. That's the only thing that I don't eat. But that's about it, really. So uh, during your time here in Australia as well, um, have you seen a lot of changes and influences in the food industry yeah, over the last decade? Or maybe even maybe even 20 years? We could probably go back a little bit further. Um, let, I'll talk about... I think, you know, I, it's fair that I talk about Italian cuisine um, and regional cuisine because Italy is divided in 20 different regions and then including in 20 regions there is, there is two big islands, Sardinia and Sicily, so the food is very diverse. Um, so when you are away from Italy, Italian restaurants, I think they were doing, especially I think, you know, when they started in America, when the first Italians started to, you know, emigrate to America, the, the, the Italian food was seen in not such a good way in terms of especially restaurant experience because eating at home eating in a restaurant it's always very different restaurant it's more of an experience home you eat because you know it's comfort it's family it's getting together so you know it's it's different but the italian food that was seen in restaurants and then i saw when i came here in 92 to be honest it was pretty shocking it was pretty shocking because you know i work with um, some guys that, just to give you a couple of examples, you know, they used to say, oh, you know, put pecorino and call it parmesan. People wouldn't even know what it is anyway. And it was probably true. A lot of people didn't know because they weren't educated about what real Italian cuisine was, what original cuisine was. Um, you know, crazy stuff. But anyway, over the years, things slowly started changing. And I think it was about... 10 to 12 years ago that there has been a big turnaround in regional Italian cuisine and I think we kicked it on as in some of the oldies like me and then more oldies like you know Armando Piercogo and Lucio Galletto and Beppe all these guys that they had restaurants before I came here we got all together and created a small uh, group called Council of Italian Restaurants of Australia with Chira because we really wanted to turn this thing around and, and, and start you know, cooking and promoting regional cuisine. And I think it, it took a really big turn. At the point that, um, you know, we still get customers coming to Pillow Freshwater and having, you know, a meal, and they say, Giovanni, we eat better here than we did in Italy. And I got a bit of, you know, a bit of mixed feelings about that because, yeah, great, I, I like that, and that's good. But, you know, to say that, you know, they eat better than Italy, that, you know, I, I'm a little bit sad about that because even in Italy, I think, Things are going 100% well at the moment, and you know the service. I think is sort of, um, you know, it's been compromised a bit by the situation at the moment. So, you know, here we're doing a great job, and I think Italian food is gone from here up to here. There is some brilliant restaurants doing regional cuisine, and some modern stuff like, you know, Lumi. You know, uh, Federico is the chef of the year. He won, so you know that says that, that, that says a lot. Number one restaurant in the world is Italian at the moment. So tomorrow I'm going to Melbourne for the San Pellegrino Awards. I'm invited, which is great. Hopefully he will keep number one. Um, but all these other places, you know, you got Ormeggio, you got Balla, you got, um, you know, Bon Ricordo, you got Luches, you got all the pizzerias, you got gelaterias. So the things are really changing and improving. And Italian cuisine, I think, is really, you know, is up there. So, yeah, things have improved. And just going back to um, the idea of running your restaurant as a business, what are some of the probably greatest challenges that you're faced with today? Yeah, maybe from a financial perspective, or just you know issues that maybe people don't always consider when they want to go and open their own uh, restaurant. Yeah, um, we could probably say there's a lot of failed restaurateurs out there. Yeah, for um, what about some things that you could sort of assist us with? All right, get pen and paper. I'll tell you all the tricks now. Um, it's not like that. Look, I think, like I said before, you know, from uh, being a chef to being a restaurateur, it's very, very different. It's a different ball game. So there is, you know, so many things that I can tell you here today, but, you know, unfortunately, some things that won't apply to you guys because every venue, every location, every situation will be different. The size of your restaurant, the location, the view, um, 
there is so many components, you know, and I always remember Peter, my very first boss, say, Giovanni, a restaurant is, you know, it's made of, let's say, 10 different things that you put down on paper, and, you know, the most important things, and then may are, uh, obviously, service, food, location, you know, view, and, you know, wine list, and all the rest of it, tables, configures, 10 things. And he said, all those 10 things have to work all together well, because if one of them doesn't work, they can send you broke, okay? So there is so many different components, guys, that you need to know when you open your own restaurant. And I think one of the, one of the recommendations that I that I'll give you is that you need to take your time. You need to take your time, and you remember that the, in this job, in this industry, you steal a lot. Not from the cool room, you know, things, meet and put it in your jacket and run. You steal this job, so you need to be always looking, asking questions. So when you when you're working, you know, where you're working now, you need to always try to learn as much as you can and steal this industry. So it's up to you guys to absorb as much as you can. And you know, the time will come. You know, time will come. Look, I, I think I was I was reluctant to open my first restaurant because I was 27 and I thought I was still very very young. But you know, because I had Tony, my partner, that he was older and wiser, and then when Marilyn came on board, you know, obviously, you know, she helped me a lot. There is time, you know, you can't, you know, I think that's something that maybe come up later on, but chefs these days, you know, unfortunately you qualify to be a chef when you're still very young. You may be 21 when you qualify, 22, and that is super young. So from there, it's a big journey. You need to travel. You need to work with other chefs. You need to learn all the secrets and techniques of your, uh, you know, your prime job first, which is, you know, to be a chef. And then slowly you need to learn to become a restaurant chef. Okay. And then there is all these things that you need to know about the rent, about, you know, all the expenses, all the things that they come up that you just go absolutely crazy. The breakages. The the I can I can in the car today. I got two calls. One is because the storm water is not working, and the other one, the fridge on pastry broke again, so we have to chuck everything away and start again. And these things happen every single day, guys. So there is stuff that you don't know about, and that's part of you know running your own restaurant. So the costs sometimes are so high and full of surprises, and you need more staff and all the tax. There is a lot to learn, so take your time. Don't rush. It'll come, okay? Don't let, you know, your friend or your competitor or your proud take over or your family push you or whatever because, you know, you need to, you need to, you know, grow into this industry. There is a lot to learn before you get and start your own venture. And like, you know, Justin said, there is a lot of failures out there, unfortunately, because I think people thought that it was easy and everyone can do it. And look, Giovanni can do it. And you know, it looks so good, it comes onto the floor and talks to all these customers and it's a brilliant life and I, I'm going to do that, I'm going to quit, you know, be a lawyer and then I'm going to open up a restaurant. Great. Good luck. <laughs> yeah. It does. Yeah. Yeah, a great answer, yeah. Um, just changing the uh, subject a little bit, uh, social media uh, seems to be play a very big important part in our industry these days, yeah, especially with everybody with all the current TV shows. Um, in what ways, how do you, what, what, what's your opinion about social media? Can you use it to your advantage? Um, do, does, do you think negative social media affects you in some way as well? Or maybe, probably not from a business point of view, but just give us some thoughts about that, please. Um, I'll be silly if I sit here and go and say that social media is crazy, or it doesn't work, or you know, it, uh, don't worry about it. It's, I think it's now becoming a big, you know, part of what we do because with social media you basically can get you know so many people and the audience is so much bigger now um, I think and that's been said I'm not the one to tell you that you need to use social media wisely um, and you know not only personally but I think you know if you got a business you got to be careful what you put on social media what you say um, there has been crazy things that I've seen you know chefs fighting and arguing on social media and you know <sighs> there has been crazy stuff that I wouldn't even think about doing anything like that. It's absolutely mental. And I'm lucky enough that I have a very smart and wise wife. 
So when I write something on social media now, I learned, it's a deal that we have now, that she reads it first, and then I post it, because I can say something very stupid, and maybe it's not good. Um, so it's important that you measure what you do and what you say. Uh, we use it a lot to our benefit in terms of, you know, we opened up our last little venue last week, the little barretto next to Pillow of Freshwater, was a cafe, now it's a small wine bar. So we put in a post, because the weather is so freaking crazy at the moment. No one was coming down at night because it was raining. And I put up a post saying, um, come in anyway, because now we have a cover and we have a heater. You know, it's weatherproof the place. Come and try it or not. And then I'll drinks. Um, and then, you know, I had such a massive reaction on Facebook that, you know, we filled up the place on Saturday night only because I put this post out. So things like that, amazing, brilliant. But to um, have a go at someone or beg some other restaurant or a food critic or any, anything to do with, you know, it, it's very bad. Do not ever think about doing anything like that. Use it just to your advantage and to promote your business and, you know, to put something happy, something that makes sense. You know, don't just put rubbish on there. Um, and, yeah, I think, I think it's great. You can't not have it. Yeah. Um, getting close to finishing up soon but just a couple more things before we go and then if anyone has any question we might have a couple of minutes for that but probably what's one of the best bits of advice you could give to any of our young aspiring chefs here today if there was one thing that you could actually sort of in one sentence maybe or one particular area that they could concentrate on I think what I say to my young chefs and I think I mentioned it before you need to take your time guys basically this is and it's, it's not, it's, it's, unlike, it's like any other things that you want to do, I think. You need, to, you need to build up into it. You need to gain experience. Um, my son is studying to be an architect. And he's a young kid. He's 19. First year at university. He's so overwhelmed by the amount of work that he's got to do. And, you know, it's like, but he's loving it, which is great. You know, I'll be like when I started. I love what I do. And I, don't want, I never wanted my kids to do something that they didn't love because... My parents said to me, Giovanni, if you don't want to study and you want to work, great. And that, is, that was so important for me that, you know, that got me into what I love doing without too many objections and I think that drove me even more, you know. So I said to my son, listen, you're going to be finished luck if you're lucky and you study hard. In four years, you're going to be an architect, 23 years old. Can you imagine an architect when he's 23? No one, was, no one wants to talk to him. No one wants to see him until he's what, 30, 32, 35, that he's got experience, he's been working for others, and he's, you know, he's, he's, he's made a bit of a name or whatever, and that's when, you know, you, you can then, you know, start looking at doing, you know, your own thing and, and your own venture. So you need to take your time, guys, okay? Don't worry about MasterChef, My Kitchen Rules, and all this other stuff on telly. Look, it's good. Because I think it turned our industry around. Everyone is so much more interested in food and in what we do. I think it's great. I mean, imagine, and the knowledge, yeah, the knowledge and everyone is a critic now. Brilliant. Bring it on. It's all constructive, you know. There is some stuff that we take very seriously now. Or, um, and there could be maybe, you know, one or two things that every now and then we go, you know what, that doesn't make sense. That someone makes a comment about what we do. But normally we take everything now that there's say to us very seriously it's all constructive and sometimes maybe it's wrong or right or wrong you gotta you know make sure that you 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 know you respond and you think about it okay so time okay when you're 21 and qualified you're not a restaurateur and you're not even a chef okay i say always i'm a cook by trade this word chef i think has gone to everyone's heads <laughs> they want to become you know superstars and you know and not everyone is you know Matt Moran in in a day or George Columbaris or Peter Gilmore or all these guys they've been you know working in our industry for many 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 years you know and that's and now they are what they call celebrities it'll come guys yeah and not everyone is going to be a celebrity believe me celebrity chef it's a big word it's a massive word and, I, and, and that's wrong, I think, sometimes. Can you imagine what would a celebrity chef be without their team? What would someone like Matt Moran or, you know, um, some of these great chefs, you know, be without their, their team? They're nobodies. One person cannot run 
a restaurant or multiple restaurants like these guys have got unless they have a brilliant team behind them. So the word celebrity chef is very big, okay? Someone attempted to say to me that I'm a celebrity chef and I, I shut him up straight away. He said, listen, I am nobody. I'm Giovanni Pilu. I'm a cook by trade. I now, I now run my own restaurant and I am lucky that I have a brilliant team and a smart wife that it helps me to run my business. So celebrity, I don't want it. I don't want the head. I'm just, I, I'm, I am where I am. So, you know, yeah. Oh, fantastic, yeah. Uh, any other big challenges on the horizon or are you just happy doing what you're doing at the moment or you must maybe get offers and people want to business propositions quite regularly? Um, yes, uh, there is always something that comes up and it's very tempting because you think you are wiser and have a little bit more time up my sleeve in terms of you know not being in the kitchen all the time and doing other things and I go, you know what, uh, maybe I can do something else or something else. But to be honest, I think it's better to run, you know, like smaller places and fewer places and well, rather than having so many and then not doing it well. I know that there is so many chefs now going to Bali and going overseas and interstate. You know, there is, look, I can give you so many examples of restaurants that they tried and open up interstate even, never mind going to another country. And they haven't made it because it's very hard. So. To, you know, for you guys to keep an eye on what you do, it's important that you stay in your restaurant and or close by. So we got three venues at the moment, Acuna Bay, Pilo Barretto, which is the small kiosk, which is next door to the restaurant, and the restaurant. That's it. And I've got asked multiple times to do anything in Barangaroo or, you know, these new places. And it's all so tempting because people want to... You know, they, they, they want to pay for your feet out and they want to do this and they want to do that and they want to give you this and give you that. But then you got to run the place and then you got to pay the rent. And how am I going to run a restaurant if I live in Curl Curl, work in fresh water every day and then come across to Barangaroo and try to, you know, keep an eye on all this? It goes crazy. It can't. So, you know, in the high rise at the moment, more cycling because <laughs> I'm passionate about cycling. Um, because that keeps me fit as well and sharp and improve what we're doing. So I always try to get better and better in what we're doing. We always work and we keep working on exceeding customer expectation. That is my goal. And training young chefs. I love that. And even in front of ours. I mean, for me, it's so rewarding to see over the, all these years, guys that they work for us, that they are now running their own businesses, they've been traveling overseas. I bumped into Brock the other day that he was one of my chefs. I said to him, what are you doing, man? I haven't seen you around and I see photos everywhere. So he's working in maxi yachts overseas and he, he loves that kind of lifestyle. He works in Monte Carlo, in Sardinia, in you know, Nice, in Portofino, and that's what he does. And then comes back to Australia, he works at the snow. So he's absolutely loving his life. That's another, you know, yeah, that's a, an, another aspect of the hospitality. You can travel anywhere in the world and you always find a job. It's so exciting. Or, you know, guys like Joseph that, you know, he worked with us and now he's got about three or four restaurants and cafes and pizzerias. Or my current, you know, head chef, Jason Saxby, that he started with us as an apprentice and now he's our head chef. That's what excites me. You know, that is like what, you know, I look forward to. And I want to do more of this and more cycling. Thank you. Um, would anybody have any questions for Giovanni before we, before we finish up? Anybody? Tony? Um, so when we started Freshwater, to be honest, and you know what? Um, luck, it's one of those words that I always go, you know what? Luck, you got to go look for it. There's no way that luck is going to come knock at the door and you'll be watching telly on the sofa and then luck is going to go, come with me. So we were lucky when we opened Freshwater in 2004. A couple of things, I think that particular year there wasn't many openings of restaurants, unlike now that you know every day there is multiple openings and it's very, very competitive, very challenging. But back then I remember there wasn't many openings and we opened up and then we won straight away um, Best New Restaurant award in the Sydney Morning Herald, Good Food Guide. And that was a great award because um, you only have one crack at being new one year and that's it. And then you're not new anymore. So that was an important award. And then 
we got awarded two chef sets. So from the, the first year we retained the two chef sets now for 14 years. So the start of Pilu was, you know, quite good. You know, that really helped us a lot. The media loved us and, you know, they gave us a really big push. I don't think now is the same, to be honest, because I don't think the, the, you know, the media has got the same impact as it used to have back then, especially the, um, I don't know if you guys remember it, but not back then it was called The Good Living. It was an insert that came out every Tuesday inside the Sydney Morning Herald. And there was like a little Bible. When you made it to The Good Living and you got a good score and two heads or one head or whatever, it was big back then. It was massive. You know, at Cala Luna, we had a restaurant for five years, and then we got our first chef's head after five years. The, the sixth year, we got awarded one chef's head, and they put us straight away onto the next level. We met then other chefs that came, and I, I met Tatsuya, I met friends with Neil Perry, I met friends with all these other chefs because it took us to the next level. And when we opened Pilu, it was a bit like that. You know, it was great media, um, you know, and, and that really helped us a lot. But it was hard work, you know. It wasn't like I said, it wasn't lucky that I was at home watching cycling and someone knocked and gone, yeah, come with me, I'm luck. This is what you got to do. No, no, no. I was three months into Pillow of Fresh Water one day. I was making pasta and I remember, all I can remember was I was leaning towards the mixer and I was looking at the door mixing and next time, next I woke up in hospital, mainly hospital, with a needle in my back because I passed out. Because I did so many hours and I didn't sleep enough that I couldn't stand up anymore. And then I was there for seven days and I thought I was going to die <laughs> because my headache was so crazy. So, um, yeah, it wasn't a walk in the park. You know, like, it's not that we say, oh, we got a pillow of fresh water. Have you, has anyone been to the restaurant? Two or three people, I think they've been? Yeah. If you look it up, we have, we have an amazing location. It's the dream of every restaurateur. Water views on Freshwater Beach, one of the most beautiful beaches in Australia, I reckon. It's cute, it's amazing, little pocket, brilliant. So we thought, you know what, we get in this restaurant, we, um, I don't know if you got a photo, but uh, similar. We, yeah, we, we thought, you know what, I said to my wife and I, we pick up this restaurant, and if the first day, the first very day that we believe that we run in this restaurant based and relying only on this beautiful restaurant and the view is the day that we need to hang up the keys and give it back to the owners and quit what we're doing. Okay? So it's not all about the view, it's not all about the location, the restaurant, that it's all about the service and you know the food and the ambience and the experience that we want to give to our customers. We are lucky that we are there on Freshwater Beach. That's how that's what we call it a bonus. When I when I meet with when we have general meetings with everyone, we call the view a bonus that we have. It's not a make or break thing. So, yeah.